Welcome, and thank you for joining us at the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston this morning. I'm Mary Cook. And I'm Ron Cookston. And we've been members for 19 years. We're working to help our church live our second principle, to affirm and promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. After addressing the events of the week, Reverend Scott will begin our sermon cycle this morning by examining how our Unitarian Universalist sources can be a touchstone to help ground and inspire us during these stressful times. For those of you new to our congregation or, on, or our online services, I invite you to continue watching after the benediction to hear more about Unitarian Universalism. Now we invite you to hear our call to worship. Come, join with us together in community this morning. In a week when the bilge water of the past year breached the hull of the new and attempted to capsize democracy, we are here together. Yes, we are here to consider how we might be a catalyst for justice in the world. But we cannot forget we are here in support and love of one another. We are here to express gratitude for those things and people in our lives that have brought us warmth and love, and to express gratitude for the gift of life itself. We are here to consider our lives and how we might make our lives more whole, more meaningful, more considerate. We are here this morning for all this and more. Come. Let us worship together. We are unitary universalists with minds that think, hearts that love, and hands that are ready to serve. to our big idea. This morning I want to say that I think being a Unitarian Universalist is great in a lot of ways. One of the ways is that we find meaning from lots of different places. We can find our own faith in a poem, in the sunshine, or in an act of justice. This morning in particular we're talking about how we can find our faith in our own direct experience. We can find it in things that make us say, wow. Things that we don't completely understand that we might call mystery. Things that give us a feeling of awe. Like lightning on a stormy night. Huge cracks of electricity burst across the sky. 
like leaf cutter ants, carrying pieces of leaf bigger than they are as they march in line through the woods. Like the light from the stars takes years to get here to earth where our eyes can see it. Like how some songs make me dance, other songs make me feel connected to something big and emotional that no words can describe my feelings at that moment. Like air, it is invisible until it blows the leaves or comes in a storm when the wind is strong enough to blow down a building. And that amazing moment when that first gasp of air is pulled into a newborn baby's lungs just after they are briskly slapped on the back. I always feel connected to the big mysterious universe when I look at the full moon. I feel a part of something unknown and yet so grand. And now a couple of members of our congregation will share what they find wonderfully mysterious and amazing. I think eyes are special. When COVID first started, I used to pay attention to people's masks, not to their eyes. But now, I always go for the eyes because I think I can tell whether they are happy, glad to see me, saying hello, or not. There's so much that eyes can share. I think they're special. I think they're a miracle. I think what's most mysterious to me is really that we're here. Um, that this uh, swarming mass of molecules somehow got together and started forming these complex systems and processes that we, that we now refer to as life. And that over millions of years, those things have gotten more and more and more complex to the point that we now have uh, consciousness. Um, because what is consciousness? I don't even know what it is. Um, so that's mysterious. I mean, <laughs> you know, who am I? Uh, and how did I get to be like this? I have no idea. I'm always in awe of uh, this time of night where the sky changes colors and the sun sets. People are winding down for the night and their nighttime rituals are starting. It makes me feel connected. For me, the mystery is the fluidity of the world around me, the constant movement, even in the most solid of rocks. The atomic particles are whirling around. We leave you with this question. What brings you awe? What is wonderfully mysterious to you? We hope you find your own curiosity brings you a feeling of connection to the mystery of this amazing world we live in and the universe beyond. Please join with me in the spirit that some call meditation and others name prayer. Make yourself comfortable. Relax. Take one deep breath and then another. Open your mind. Open your heart. Spirit of life and love, God of many names and mystery beyond all our naming, we have again gathered in community, having experienced a week not anticipated or imagined. After nearly a year of anxiety, months of stress, all endured without the face-to-face -face support of friends and family, we are ready to move on. We are ready for a vaccine. One by one, those we know are receiving it. We are so looking forward to the time we can gather together again. We are ready for a reconciled nation. We may never all agree, we may never all believe the same things, 
but we are ready for a time when politicians do not amplify animosity for their own ends. May we remember that in order to lessen our anxiety, we must show gratitude and we must help others. For when we shift our focus to what we have to be thankful for, and when we reach out to help the oppressed and those less fortunate, our unease lessens and our fears decrease. We also reach out in support and love of all those who mourn this morning, those in our community who have lost loved ones, and the families of victims of the seeming never-ending onslaught of fatal shootings in our city. It seems each morning brings news of another. May the tragic recent personal experience of, po of political leaders cause a reconsideration of common sense gun reform. We pray in the names of all those known and unknown, present and absent, remembered and forgotten. We pray in the names of all helpers of humankind. May the congregation, absent in body, though present in spirit, say amen. We pause now, together, to lift up that which sits heavy and light on our hearts. I invite you now to say the name or bring to mind those you wish to be held by the loving embrace of this religious community. They are part of the great cloud of witness and memory, and we will, even if we do not know their names, hold them in our hearts. In this great cloud of witness and memory, amid this beloved community, we hear these names and hold them in our hearts. Let us remember the suffering and joy amid and among our community that we do not know. We pause in awe and wonder of the mystery that is life in the spirit of love, in the spirit of hope, and in the spirit of compassion. I invite each of you to enter into a time of silent prayer, meditation, or reflection. This morning, our offering will be shared with the Texas Unitarian Universalist Justice Ministry. Let's hear from Chuck Freeman, the Executive Director. Buenos dias and Happy New Year, First UU Houston. I'm Reverend Chuck Freeman, honored to be the Director of your Texas Unitarian Universalist Justice Ministry. 36 of our congregations, of which you are one, 
organizing for justice in Texas. Let me tell you about some things we have done and what we will be doing. With the leadership of your ministers and the tech and your justice coordinating council, we formed the Texas U the Vote Collaborative, touching over 42,000 voters in this past election. Uh, as you know, we had record turnout in Houston, record turnout in Texas. I do believe it made a big difference. We were uh, able this time using our 501c4, which the IRS allows us to recommend vote uh, candidates to our constituency. We call it our values voting recommendations. 13 of the candidates we recommended to you uh, won election. Now our 25, 25 of our congregations voted on these five issues for the legislature starting on uh, January the 12th of this month. Racial justice, environmental justice, healthcare access, economic justice, and voting rights. We're gonna be working with allies like the Black Caucus to get the George Floyd Act bill and other good things going. So it is wise for, for you to invest in our Texas UU Justice Ministry because together we are, we will bend Texas toward and joining with me now, Justice. Today, through our shared offering to the Texas Unitarian Universalist Justice Ministry, we are helping to educate and to organize member congregations to advocate effectively for public policy that upholds Unitarian Universalist principles. So we ask you to give generously. An offering will now be gratefully received. Chapter 1, Introduction by Kathleen Rowlands from Sources of Our Faith, Inspirational Readings. Moses encountered a burning bush and took off his shoes to honor the sacred ground he stood upon. Buddha saw the morning star and attained enlightenment. Muhammad rose from his sleep and recorded what he heard Allah telling him to write. Jesus fasted in the desert for 40 days and then returned, full of the Spirit, to preach about the kingdom of God. Each of these holy men pointed towards something larger than his own personal experience or our common existence. The first source describes how we also point to our personal experiences of awe, trying not to mistake the pointing finger for the moon. Direct experience has always been critical to the Unitarian Universalist understanding of religion. It has led us to become and to affirm heretics, those who courageously stand up to orthodoxy because they trust their own experience more than traditional authority. Today, Unitarian Universalists recognize the influences of 19th century transcendentalists who brought their bodies to the shore of Walden Pond and their eyes to the New England woods around them. We have transcendent experiences of mystery and wonder in music, poetry, and essays, in both public and private settings. We have them while sitting in the early morning hours with words that inspire us, or in the silent hush of a congregation in prayer, or through the joyous winding of a spiral dance. These experiences lift us out of ourselves and inspire us toward greater acts of courageous love. We find inspiration in the natural world, in the sly smile of a coyote in our backyard, the persistent unfurling of ferns in the spring, the dappled leaf and loamy smell of soil. We have these experiences and realize that they know no creeds and have no bounds. Our second reading is The Peace of Wild Things by Wendell Berry. When despair grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go 
and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting for their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Over my head I hear music in the air. Over my head I hear music in the Moments after hitting send on our midweek email newsletter Wednesday, one in which I wished each of you a 2020 wonderful new year, a mob of domestic terrorists stormed the U.S. Capitol. Spurred on by a sitting U.S. president's acts of sedition, these insurrectionists invaded the building in an attempt to prevent the counting of presidential ballots and deny the reality of a legal and fair election. The invasion left the Congress people and their staff scrambling for cover to avoid gunfire like so many American school children before them. Despite open planning to create mayhem for weeks on social media and an impassioned exhortation just that morning by the president, for the mob to march down Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol, security was far less than it had been for peaceful Black Lives Matter protests. There is video of security guards moving aside barricades to allow the mob easier access, and one officer even posed for a selfie with a future felon. These people had been spoon-fed an alternate reality by a professional con man and reality television host whose racist, anti-elitist, and anti-intellectual populism caught much of the rest of the nation by surprise four years ago. Once elected, he surrounded himself with an ever-changing cadre of sycophants in order to do everything in their power to make themselves and those like them richer and punish anyone not like them, especially those of a different color. By this past July, 20,000 false or misleading claims by him while in office were documented. Believing the lies he told about him, winning the election in a landslide, and it being unfairly stolen, the followers violently rallied to defend a man who cares nothing about them, only about himself. In the words of French Enlightenment philosopher Voltaire, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Sadly, even on the day of the failed coup, some politicians continued to stroke the president's ego to win his approval and that of his ever-shrinking voting bloc. Even more sadly, one of those craven opportunists was the junior United States senator from Texas, Ted Cruz. His circular justification for questioning the voting results was the assertion that so many people questioned the results, ignoring both the fact that it was the president's lies that led them to question the results, and that he was complicit in spreading those lies and manufacturing the discontent that led to five deaths so far. When called upon to take responsibility for his role in agitating the violent mob, whose actions proved fatal, 
He claimed it was cynical for others to ask him to make amends for his actions when he and his colleagues had just had to contend with a violent mob. The Houston Chronicle has called upon Cruz to resign. One of our church's upcoming projects is a letter writing campaign to both those politicians who stood up for democracy this past week and those, like Senator Cruz, who don't hesitate to set truth and honor aside if it means they might gain more power. I encourage you to make your thoughts known to those elected leaders in Washington. We've put Senator Cruz's contact information in the comments section. Now that I've gotten that out of my system, I'll move on to my planned remarks which is suggesting ways that we might use to ground ourselves during difficult times, such as this past week. Although I had na naively suggested we had begun a 2020 wonderful year, <laughs> I was apparently a bit premature. The first week of the year proved as anxiety-producing as much of 2020. We still need, and indeed we always will need, touchstones in our lives to help us inspire us and ground us. Back at the end of last summer, firmly entrenched in the protocols of a pandemic, the ministers and staff discussed what emblems we might suggest to you to ground ourselves and encourage and buoy us during difficult times. We began by using the classical elements of water, earth, air, and fire as our first four themes. Ancient cultures such as Greece, Egypt, Persia, Japan, Tibet, and India all had similar lists of elements, which were proposed to explain the nature and complexity of all matters in terms of simpler substances. Today, we continue with a new set of models, our six Unitarian Universalist sources. Our living tradition of wisdom and spirituality is drawn from many sources, specifically these six. Many of us are more familiar with our seven principles, which are moral guides that reflect our strong values for those of us who covenant in Unitarian Universalist religious communities. Some UU congregations, including our own, have begun discussing the possibility of adding an eighth principle. This would lead congregations to covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. Coincidentally, the topic of Wednesday's Healing Racism discussion group is the eighth principle, and I encourage you to participate. As this proposed edition suggests, the principles and sources didn't emerge like Athena fully formed from the head of Zeus. There was much gnashing of teeth and rending of garments to create what we now see online and in the first few pages of our gray hymnals. The merger of the Universalist Church of America and the American Unitarian Association in 1961 was nearly derailed by the contentious debate to precisely word the original statement of the purposes of the Unitarian Universalist Association. The contention revolved around whether to include such phrases as love to God and love to man and a reference to our Judeo-Christian heritage. A compromise version, including a critical change from our heritage to the heritage, was finally hammered out in an all-day, all-night parliamentary negotiation and debate. These remained in place until 1984, when they were replaced by the principles and purposes closer to what we know today. By the mid-70s, several issues made it clear the existing principles seemed inadequate to many. It was becoming evident that traditions other than Judeo-Christian were informing the spirituality of our members, and an emerging primary religious concern was our relation to the environment. But, mostly, many, especially women, were becoming more and more dismayed by the blatantly sexist language of the original bylaws, 
including a reference to the dignity of man. In 1981, a non-sexist revision of the principles and purposes, drafted by various women's groups, was presented to the General Assembly. It caused great uneasiness, especially among UU Christians, who saw it as tantamount to writing them out of the UUA. Whether and how to refer to the deity in the Judeo-Christian tradition was again a stumbling block, just as it had been in the 1960 discussions. One committee member, the Reverend Harry Holler, suggested a solution. Divide the statement into two parts. First, the seven principles, followed by references to five living traditions we share. A sixth tradition, earth-centered religions, was added to the statement in 1995. By 1984, the final draft of the principles and sources was adopted by a wide margin at General Assembly. This concludes the history portion of my remarks. And by the way, this information will be on the final exam. I thought it would be interesting to share how these principles and sources we reference came to be and also show how the crafting of the revisions show our historic respect for the democratic process. Today, we highlight the first source of our living tradition, direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. Now, typically when I read this, I immediately think of how many of us, as you use, are more comfortable with our sense of reason than our sense of awe and wonder. We sometimes associate mystery and wonder with discarded lessons from rejected childhood religions and gravitate toward those things we can fully understand, those things we can quantify and explain. And I certainly get that. Since dawn of time, societies have created foundational tales and origin myths People have imagined reasons for those patterns in nature they saw and wanted explanations for what I call the big questions. How did the world begin? What powers greater than ourselves exist? What happens after we die? We need to chow down on our humble pie, of course, when we look back at these ancient civilizations, creating meaning with their limited understanding. At the beginning of the year, like Janus, we need to look both backward and forward. Our understanding will appear pitifully limited when gazed upon by future civilizations, assuming we don't destroy the planet before they have the chance. Charles H. Duell, the commissioner of the U.S. Patent Office in 1899, has been quoted as saying, everything that can be invented has been invented. Of course, like other terms I'll discuss today, myths are problematic. The main characters in myths are usually gods and demigods, and myths that often closely link to religion and spirituality, and endorsed by rulers and priests. Additionally, many societies group myths, legends, and history together, and even consider both myths and legends as true accounts of a remote past. Many people define myth as untrue fantasy and are offended by its association with their beloved religious tradition. This leads to people taking what was intended as myth and metaphor literally and focusing on the plot, so to speak, rather than the theme and lessons of the narratives. I've heard it described this way. We shouldn't be asking if the story is true. We should ask what is true about this story? I believe eternal truths may be found in stories from many faith traditions, although the events in the stories may not be factually true. And each society tends to accept their own stories as true. After all, folks have grown up with them. But they look askance with suspicion at those of others. In the play Cloud Nine by Carol Churchill, 
The African native servant, Joshua, has learned well how to respond to his British employer when asked about religion. <laughs> yes, our stories are bad. Your stories are very good. South Park creators Trey Parker and Matt Stone have made a fortune and picked up nine Tony Awards lampooning the missionaries and stories of the Church of Latter-day Saints in the Broadway musical The Book of Mormon. Julia Sweeney, comedian, actress, and author of the book God Said Ha, in the TED Radio Hour episode Believers and Doubters, ended her description of a visit by two LDS missionaries this way. I initially felt really superior to these boys and smug in my more conventional faith. But, when, but then the more I thought about it, the more I had to be honest with myself. If someone came to my door and I was hearing Catholic theology and dogma for the very first time, and they said, we believe that God impregnated a very young girl without the use of intercourse, and the fact that she was a virgin is maniacally important to us, and she had a baby, and that's the son of God, I would think that is equally ridiculous. I'm just so used to that story. I couldn't let myself feel condescending to those boys. But the question they asked when they first arrived really stuck in my head. Did I believe that God loved me with all his heart? Because I wasn't exactly sure how I felt about that question. Now, if they had asked me, do you feel that God loves you with all his heart? That would have been much different. I would have instantly answered, yes, yes, I feel it all the time. I feel God's love when I'm hurt and confused, and I feel consoled and cared for. I take shelter in God's love when I don't understand why tragedy hits, and I feel God's love when I look with gratitude at all the beauty I see. But since they asked me that question with the word believe in it, Somehow it was all different because I wasn't exactly sure if I believed what I so clearly felt. This excerpt describes so many things I'd like us to consider today. Many of you no doubt noticed the several times that Julia Sweeney invoked the name God in her account. She and the missionaries both used the word God and knew what each other meant, although they would have no doubt given different descriptions of the deity. Some UUs are allergic to the word God. UU ministers have spent untold hours finding synonyms for the divine to attempt to avoid the negative associations some congregants have with the word. And I understand far too many preachers who are guilty of theological malpractice literally put the fear of God into their listeners, making the deity a judgmental and hateful facsimile, facsimile of themselves. Some victims of these alleged ministers have come to UU churches to get away from the abuse. I tend to use the term God of many names and mystery beyond all our naming. It both uses the term God, the most common term for the divine, and gives voice to the reality that we do not have the vocabula vocabulary or understanding to adequately describe that which is greater than any of us. The first source cites a transcending mystery and wonder. I believe some people do not believe in a higher power because they do not believe in the narrow and spiteful version of an indefinable spirit. But because that hateful deity does not exist does not mean that none does. I've read of people imploring, tell me about the God you don't believe in. I probably don't believe in that one either. The religion of Julius Sweeney's childhood and the presentation of the stories of the missionaries were focused on the myths, legends, and purported histories of the religions. But she was focused on her feelings, her direct experience of that transcending and mysterious love. And that is what our source is referencing, 
our direct experience. I fear that when people deny the accuracy of the stories of mainstream or childhood religions, they are also discounting the personal direct experiences they have available that can deepen our lives and help give them meaning. I often get the sense that people who claim to be spiritual but not religious are rejecting the literalism and dogma of religion while embracing the direct experiences. Of course, this doesn't describe Unitarian Universalist congregations, and it discounts the importance of religious community where we uplift and support one another. And that is why this is one of the important sources of our living tradition. Our personal experiences of whatever our experience of, of the divine is or isn't, our understanding of those myths and legends and origin stories, our theological ancestors told those usurpers of theology that our experience and understanding of the divine was just as valid as theirs. Just one of the reasons we've been branded heretics. Our direct experience of nature, like our ancestors, the transcendentalists, our transcendent experiences of music, poetry, art, and the written and spoken word all inspire us to greater love of the world and one another. We return to these personal experiences to renew our spirit, to nourish our souls, and to feed our longing for connection. During these dark days, may you take the time to pause and take advantage of these experiences around you.
riddle and a mystery, mystery, mystery. Life is a riddle and a mystery, mystery, mystery. Life is a riddle and a mystery, mystery, mystery. Life is a riddle and a mystery, mystery, mystery. Life is a riddle and a mystery, mystery, mystery. Life is a riddle and a mystery. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I share these words of the Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker. The beauty of life is such that it will not let us go until we have offered the blessing we have to give. So. Let the beauty we have seen become the good that we do, and let us not wrest ourselves free from the claim that life places upon us until we, in faith with all those who have gone before us, place upon ourselves among those who bless the world. Go in peace. Let the beauty you have seen become the good that you do, and go forth and bless the world. Amen. Please join us in thanking Paige Powell and Katie Molina for lighting the chalice this morning, Carol Burris for the big idea, staff members Alec, Alex Kemming and Christian Holmes for participating in today's service, and music director Mark Vogel for the beautiful music. For those of you who may be new to this congregation or the online services, let us say a few words about Unitarian Universalism. Unitarian Universalism is a faith where you can bring your whole self, your full identity, your questioning mind, your expansive heart. As Unitarian Universalists, we join together on a journey that honors everywhere we've been before. Together we create a force more powerful than one person or one belief system. Our beliefs are diverse and inclusive. Rather than a creed, we share a covenant based on a set of seven principles. These include the free and responsible search for truth and meaning, the inherent worth of dignity of every person, and the knowledge that we are a part of an interconnected web of existence that calls us to honor the earth and all creatures. Thank, Thank you, you for, for being, being with, with us today. today. While our church as buildings is closed, our church as people is still meeting, but now online. There are weekly and monthly offerings to keep you connected and engaged with our community. Join us this morning at 11.30 for the Coffee Half Hour. There's no topic or agenda. Log in to interact with new and old friends. Dr. Boston's Texts for Troubled Times meets Tuesday at 5 to discuss The Betrothed by Alessandro Menzoni. The next evening, the Wednesday Discussion Group meets at 5 to discuss the proposed 8th UU Principle. Come to Membership 101 Thursday at 6 to get more information about joining the church or attend the second Thursday discussion group at 6.30. They'll discuss education and critical thinking skills. Young adults won't want to miss Friday at 3 when you can meet with others for conversation and sharing. Many of the topics for upcoming discussion groups are on our website, firstuu.org forward slash online hyphen group hyphen meetings. Visit there for more details and to sign up. And remember, all times shown are Central Standard Time.